Christina and I just uh, got back from vacation. We uh, went to this gorgeous beach, and we were sitting there looking at gorgeous shells and saw beautiful things. And, and I got to say, there's no place like home. I would trade being uh, here for being there anytime. Um, this was a good time, y'all. So thank you for that. Um, I totally believe that in this next little bit of the service, God has a tendency to move through his word and uh, through the things that come up in our minds and our hearts as much as it is through anything I might say. So with that, uh, I want to pray for us, and then then we'll dive into Scripture. Lord, um, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for um, the ways that you were with us in the worship and in the announcements, and be with us as we consider your word together. Uh, bring things to our hearts and to our minds that you want to be on them, and uh, use me. Blow away the extra stuff I have to say like chaff, but if there's something of you in it, uh, plant it deep in our hearts so it can change our lives. We love you. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, as Jana mentioned, we are doing this series on calling, and uh, we were, Christina and I were having dinner with some friends recently, and um, we were talking about kind of what was being talked about in our different churches, and I was sharing about this thing that we're doing on calling, and I could see, as I shared with my friend, uh, his face kind of get tilted a little bit and a little bit twisted, like, ah. and uh, I said, what, what do you think about this? And, and he said, you know, I don't know about this whole thing like calling. And uh, he goes, I'm, I'm an accountant. I've been an accountant my whole career. Uh, my dad was an accountant before me. And I honestly have never felt called to be an accountant. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I've ever met anyone in my entire field who has felt called to be an accountant. And uh, I have to say that in some ways I agree with them. I even get a little nervous around this word calling because I sometimes feel like it's like some way for uh, maybe overly spiritual people to kind of put some extra oomph behind something that they really felt like doing. <laughs> oh, I, I, I just felt called to get ice cream last night. Later. <laughs> oh, Lord, just led me down to the freezer there. <laughs> And, and it's tricky, like we, we look at these stories in scripture um, and they're hard to connect to our lives. I mean, Moses got to see a burning bush that didn't burn up when it was on fire. The only burning bush I've ever seen was when I was out camping with my dad and he accidentally lit it on fire and it was gone shortly thereafter. Um, I haven't had a vision from God where I was taken up into heaven and then God said, go here and do this, uh, like Isaiah, and I've never heard uh, the verbal voice of God, like Abraham, say, leave this place and go to that place. So um, quite the opposite, actually. I think uh, for me, calling has come through some very, very ordinary things. I was uh, sitting with Alice recently having coffee, and she asked how I ended up at Harbor. And as I was sharing my story of kind of, well, I was uh, working in an office and felt like a strong sense that I really wanted to get back into ministry. And Christina and I had gone on a little vacation to figure out what that might mean. And um, and then somewhere in the midst of that, it kind of clicked into place that maybe I should call John. And John said it would be okay if I came here. And so uh, it worked out. Um, it didn't feel overly spiritual to say it that way. And yet God was in the midst of it. Most of the time, I think God works calling out in our lives in pretty ordinary, less than miraculous, spectacular ways. Uh, he doesn't need a neon sign to do that, and he doesn't need a miracle for it to be something profound from him. So uh, today I want to dig into that a little bit more. Uh, scripture definitely affirms that in Christ we are called people. He has called us into his family. He has shown us uh, grace and mercy, and then he calls us to live a particular life among those around us. And it's not just uh, a calling that applies to everybody either. There are those, like, it's good to be honest, and uh, God does call us to be truthful and to be people who are a witness to him. Uh, that applies to all of us, but I really believe that God has a calling and a unique call on each of our lives. Um, so I'm going to get into what does it mean for my accountant friend? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for us to encounter what it means to be called this week, practically? Um, so we're going to look at Esther. Um, I know lots of you have been spending lots of time in Scripture reading Esther. Um, frankly, I have not. It was this week that I reread it. I love the book. Um, but if you have a Bible, pop it open. It's a shoot for the middle. You'll hit Psalms. Thumb your way towards the front cover. You'll hit Job, and then you'll get Esther. So that's how you find that. Or you can do what most of us do and just hit the Bible app and then click <laughs> Esther. Um, we're going to look at Esther chapter 4. And... Um, 
Yeah, it's gotten so much easier, man. Um, I mean, while you're uh, kind of getting that open, let me tell you why I love Esther. Esther is one of those few books in Scripture that actually doesn't make any explicit reference to God. Nowhere in it does it say, the Lord said this, the Lord did this, the Lord called so-and-so to do something. And yet you cannot read this uh, five-chapter book without being struck at how profoundly God uses Esther and how God moves. It's almost like he's the director and the writer and the choreographer of this entire story. And yet he's never in front of the camera. And that for me is great encouragement because over the past 20 years of following the Lord, I feel like that's how he's worked the most in my life. Um, I haven't re- I haven't seen God necessarily take the center stage and do miraculous things very often. I've seen it a few times. But more often than not, I feel like God is choreographing and moving and bringing people together and speaking specific words through other people into my life that he somehow uses to transform things. So um, I think it's a great answer to the dramatic, overly spiritualized ways we sometimes think of call, and I think it very much applies to what this week could be for us. So uh, for those of us who haven't read Esther in a while, I'm going to give you the lightning fast retelling of the story. It's important to get what's going on in the book of Esther before we can dive into just those verses. And um, it's going to be a little bit like when you watch TV, they have that little part before where they go, here's what you've missed on Esther. (laughs) And um, then they give you all the kind of big plot lines. So I'm going to attempt to do that with uh, four chapters of scripture here. So uh, Esther begins with a Persian uh, emperor by the name of Xerxes, who has conquered most of the known world at the time. He is the most rich, powerful man on the planet. Uh, Think Bill Gates, except very intimidating with lots of armies. Uh, That's him. So uh, as he conquered people, what he would do is he would take the groups of people that he had conquered and he would scatter them throughout his empire. That way none of them could really get together and kind of form a coup and uh, overthrow them. And so uh, Xerxes has scattered everybody around and Esther uh, in our story is this um, young woman who... uh, is a Jewish girl, and her parents have passed away. Her second cousin, who was sort of an uncle figure in her life, has taken her in, and they live together in the capital of Susa. Now, uh, what do you do when you're incredibly wealthy and when you've conquered most of the known world and you're getting ready to conquer something else again? Uh, what do you do? You, you throw a party and you show off what you've done, and that's what exactly what he did. He had his treasures and uh, big parades kind of all through his empire, and then uh, to cap it all off, he threw his grand finale party in the capital, and it was an open bar party that lasted an entire week. <laughs> so the Persians knew how to party. <laughs> I think it probably made Vegas look a little tame, but... Uh, so everyone is thoroughly sloshed. Um, Xerxes himself, in addition, and they're all uh, in his capital party, and uh, he decides he has one more thing to show off to all of his important leaders and, uh, and uh, military folk, and that is his trophy wife, a lady by the name of Vashti. And so he says, he sends for Vashti to come to him, and he says, you know, Vashti, come wearing your crown. Now, just to warn you all, I might lose my PG rating for this, but uh, most commentators say that he ordered her to come just with her crown. Um, And he was going to show her off to a bunch of drunk military men. Uh, Not a good scene. Now, Vashti is regal. She's a queen, and she does what any self-respecting queen would do and says no. Unfortunately, telling the richest, most powerful person in the world no in front of all of the people who he is over is not a uh, something that's going to fly. So he decides uh, that if she won't come into his presence right now, she should never come into his presence again. Bye bye, Vashti. Kicks her out, sends her into exile. Frankly, she was lucky to keep her head that day. So. Uh, party ends, Xerxes wakes up, realizes he has a major hangover, and that he's gotten a divorce during the said party. Um, so what does he do? Does he go to her? Does he beg her to come back to him? No, he's the most powerful man on the planet, and she was just a trophy wife, so he can replace her just like he's going to replace the curtains that people spilled wine on. And so he sent people throughout his whole uh, empire to find the most beautiful girls in the empire. And if they found a really, really beautiful woman, they were to basically bring them to the castle, kidnap them, and say, you might be a potential wife for him. 
And then they would undergo a year worth of uh, finishing school and beauty treatments. And then they would meet Xerxes, and he would pick a wife. Yeah, trophy wife. Total token trophy wife. Um, and that's where we meet Esther. She gets taken along with a bunch of others, and it says that uh, Esther impresses everybody, and uh, he chooses her to be his next trophy wife. So Esther, uh, we think of her as the beautiful queen, but she was basically kidnapped. Um, she was not in a place necessarily that she wanted to be. Maybe she liked it there. Maybe she was glad to finally be out from just trying to survive and enjoy the food and enjoy the castle and all of that stuff. But really, she was just an object to have next to the king when he had his parades, and um, that's where she finds herself. So I'm going to wrap up this story really quickly. Uh, there's a guy in this kingdom who is a... Uh, uh, military leader, and he wants people to bow down to him. He has a huge ego, and he insists that everybody bow down to him when he comes through town, and uh, Mordecai, Esther's uncle, says, no way. He's kind of a punk, and I love the Lord, so I'm not going to bow down to him. And he gets so mad that he says, we need to wipe out these Jewish people altogether. So he convinces Xerxes to just wipe them out, have one day where they're just going to get rid of all the Jewish people in the empire. And Mordecai is freaking out and sends Esther a message and says, you've got to do something about this. And Esther reminds him that uh, she can't just go before the king. You don't show up unannounced when you're a woman, even if you're his wife, and start telling him what he should be doing with policy. And that if he's not happy when she shows up, they will kill her on the spot. She hasn't seen him in a month. It's not like she's going to get an invite real soon. And that brings us to chapter 4, verses 12 through 17, which I'm going to read for you. So, when Esther's words, reminding Mordecai that she can't just go before Xerxes, were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your families, you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. And then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go before the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Okay, so that's where we're going to sit for a minute. I'm going to hit the pause button on our story. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in the bigness of the story. Uh, it's kind of almost fairy tale-ish, like a queen, a genocide. These are big, heavy, crazy, huge things. And she has the opportunity. She has this calling to be the queen that has been placed into this position, and then she can do something dramatic to save her entire people. Uh, that's kind of a big, big thing. But there's stuff underneath that that I actually appreciate even more, and it's the stuff that we can relate with. Um, because I don't think Esther was all that different from us in a lot of ways as we deal with calling. And the first thing I want to consider with you is the place that she was put. Um, she spends her week milling around the castle with a job title of queen. Um, she, if you were to translate that, and especially in that empire, it's pretty person that belongs to Xerxes and decorates the castle. So that's her role. It's not what she had expected out of life. It's not what she hoped for out of life, and I doubt that she ever got a memo or had a sense deep in her heart, I am made for queening. Um, and yet this is where she is. And as she went about uh, her life in the castle, it says that because of her character and because of who she was, uh, folks, they, they liked her. They appreciated her. Uh, her beautician and the nobles of the kingdom liked her. But she was no doubt with some people that she really liked. And, she probably ran across Haman a lot who wants to wipe out her people and probably didn't like him near as much. Um, and in that way, she's a lot like us. We go into our week, and during this week, we will run across some difficult people, and we'll probably run across some great people that we like. We'll go maybe to a job that is quite uh, imperfect, maybe not exactly what we hoped for. Uh, and um, that's, where they, that's where she is. 
It's a particular place at a particular time, which is not ideal. And she's called to do a particular work, which I doubt she ever felt a deep calling for. Calling, I don't think, is the sense of, I was destined for this. And as I hear people talk about calling, as I've considered calling, uh, I think sometimes we think that's what it's supposed to be. I feel this great calling to be a teacher, and it's so noble, or I feel this calling to do this. And so we get our sights set on this very, very spiritual experience, when maybe calling is, where has God put you? What place do you find yourself? Calling is about where we are. That's our place. We're called. Where you are this week, you're called. Um, I have taken up sort of a side job that I'm excited about. I'm going to drive for Uber, which makes me a glorified taxi cab. Um, but the crazy thing is I'm just as called to be here considering the word with you all as I am called to be sitting in that car tomorrow with whoever gets into my car. And there's a calling there. God can work in that space through who I am and through that situation just as much as he could work through where I am right now. Where do you spend your week? What do you spend your week doing? Who do you spend it with? Um, I came here in part because I, I really like John Westfall. He's an amazing man and a, a fantastic preacher. And uh, I hope that we get to hear more of him instead of more of me. But um, I came here to be mentored by him. And so I'm so excited because I brought a whiteboard and he loves to draw <laughs> little grids. And so I'm going to share a grid with you that I've actually been thinking about a lot as we've kind of considered what it means to be called. And um, I'm going to attempt to do this. I don't know quite how he does it with the mic and all that, but we're going to. Oh, John can't see it. Well, there we go. Yeah, he's left so and he's left handed. So this is going to be tricky. But. Whoa, all right. Hey, I'm a rookie. I'm a rookie at this. This is way harder than I thought. Um, I want to show you something uh, that I've had presented to me a couple times, and it is the sphere of influence. And maybe you've heard of that before. But uh, Jesus had one of these. We all have one of these. Um, for Jesus, he had his three disciples that show up at very key moments. The transfiguration, the, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Who was with him? James, Peter, and John. These were his tightest of tight people. So he had this little circle of people who saw and did everything with him. And you and I have one of those little circles of key people. This is like the people we have the most impact on. Your family, closest family members, uh, the people that you live with, uh, the people that you spend the most time with. I had a job where I was in a like 10 by 10 foot room with another desk jammed up against mine. And I think during that time, I spent more time with that coworker than I even spent with my wife because we were both working. I was there with her eight, nine hours a day. Um, she would fit in that circle during that season of my life. I had a lot of contact with her. So these really, really tight people, these are the people that you rub off on a lot. And if you think about like a lake and a rock, toss it in, right, and ripples go out from it. Uh, where that rock is tossed, the deepest ripples, the biggest ripples will be. So this is our constant contact people. Then uh, out here maybe is a, a smaller group. Jesus had 12 people that he spent a lot of time with, but they weren't there for the transfiguration or the, the prayer in the garden, but they were definitely with him a lot. Who are those folks that you spend a good amount of time with, you run into a lot, because you're having an impact on them? And God might have a calling for you for those folks. And then out here, there were even more. There were the crowds. There were a lot of other disciples. Jesus at one point sent out 72. We don't even know their names. But there were these larger and larger groups of people, and, and the impact is smaller and smaller the further out you go from the people that you hit a lot. And I think it's a really great way to think about what it is to be called. Because you are called by God to have an impact here, here, and here. What's that look like to do that? What's it look like to be in each of those places with each of those people and say, God, use me. I'm going to be your representative here. I'm going to try to live out what it means to be a Christ follower here and see what kind of impact that has. That's where God has put you. Now, I don't know if uh, your story of how you got to this place with these particular people doing what it is that you do all week uh, happened. I don't know if it was your plan from the beginning, like my wife, who's an incredible planner and knew at the very beginning when she was in third grade that she was going to be a teacher 
even though she's not a teacher now. She, uh, she went her way through college, knew she was headed there and was a teacher for 10 years. Uh, that's how she got to that destination. Me is sort of a roundabout road, very fitting of my ADD. So um, I don't know how you got there, but it's where you are, and that's where your calling is. Um, Larry uh, Stone, one of our elders who I really appreciate uh, the things that he has to say, and I run across him a lot on a Wednesday morning. He's a good coach, too, so he says the same thing to me a lot so that I can finally take it in because he knows I'm probably ADD by now. And, uh, and he says, you know, God gave me today for a reason. I just got to figure out what it is. And that's how he approaches every day. Every day is a gift, and he gets to figure out what he's going to do in it. Uh, Paul over there has, has told me it's a little bit like a treasure hunt, like an a Easter egg hunt, where God's got this stuff out there for us, and we get to go through our day and stumble across it. And, and it's really fun. Like Calling, I don't think, is supposed to be this heavy, burdensome thing. God's got stuff for us. Paul in Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good things that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And we should walk in those. It's not a big figuring out. Calling, I feel like, is something we spend a lot of time trying to figure out. And it's something that we just do. And then we look in hindsight and go, man, I was called into that moment. And that person was called to me in that moment. And something got happened. When I went off to Bible school, young man, uh, I went with a profound anger and frustration at my stepmom. Uh, I don't think I've hated very many people in my life, but I can say that there were times where I definitely hated her. And um, my roommate turned out to be a guy by the name of Jason. And Jason is one of the most uh, gifted uh, counselors that I have ever met. He doesn't even work as a counselor. I think he works as a maintenance man last time I talked to him. But he has this incredible knack for asking people really good questions, for giving really, really good suggestions, and for helping people make steps through stuff that they're stuck in. It's a cool thing to watch. And um, I don't know if Jason ever felt called to help me with my issues with my stepmom. But over a six-month period, I do know that being around that guy brought me to a place where I was willing to extend forgiveness to her, and I was able to drop a burden, and I actually could appreciate it. Did God call Jason towards me in that moment? I believe so. Would he have ever felt called? He might not have even recognized that he was used, and yet there's a calling there. As uh, my accountant friend who we had dinner with, as we talked more about calling, he said, you know, I don't, I don't feel called to be an accountant, but I do feel called to do it a certain way. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be uh, servant-hearted towards the people that, that are our clients. And, and I want to do it in such a way that I'm fully invested in that, that God can use. Um, maybe that's calling. It's a better picture for me. So how are we going to go about it this week? Let's get practical um, rather than theoretical. Uh, Esther 4, 15 and 16 uh, says this, and she has some great uh, pieces that I think we could include, some ingredients that might help us to be successful if we're going to live in the calling this week. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews that are in Susa and fast for me. And fasting is usually linked with prayer. Uh, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She does what she's going to do. She does what the right thing is to do, and maybe callings like that. Sometimes we stumble across things, and we go, man, I should say this, or I should do this, or this person looks like they could use a hand. I should, I should move into that. But there's two things that she added to it, community and prayer. Um, prayer is incredible. It, it uh, not only, I believe, has an impact in the world and can change things. When we pray for stuff, though, it opens our eyes and it opens our hearts to actually be available to God and to see what God might have for us that day, that treasure hunt. It, it helps us to find some stuff. Um, I have this habit of praying in the shower. Uh, I know, visual image, block it out as soon as possible. Um, but I, I, I like to pray through my day. That's, that's a routine place that I am in the morning of the day, and I can think through what's going to happen today for the most part that I have planned, and I pray for those meetings and those people that I'm going to come across. It's a good habit for me. Um, but when, we, when we're able to, to focus and pray, we begin to discover 
that God has some stuff in that day for us. Um, and that's where I want to see calling worked out for us. Uh, the other place is community. Um, she doesn't do it alone. She could go before Xerxes and give it her best shot. And yet she says, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this alone. I need everybody around me to be with me in this. Um, and I think that's a good way for us to encounter what it means to be called in our weekly life. We saw that small group get up here and uh, make that wonderful announcement. And we have a couple small groups here. I'm in one of them on Wednesday morning. And frankly, we go through Proverbs on Wednesday morning with a bunch of guys. So if you're the male persuasion and you happen to be free at 7 a.m. on a Wednesday, come join us. Uh, but it's not about Proverbs. I don't think any of us would say that that is just about learning the Proverbs. It's, it's about processing life and stumbling across some, some ways that God might want us to work out our lives. When we live in community, when we process our life, when we talk about what's going on, uh, God begins to use other people in our lives to unfold what it means to be called and what the next steps for us are. Um, it's, it's a very cool thing. We're brought into community with Christ. He's our vine. We're the vine. Ugh. He's the vine. We're the branches. If we can stay connected with him, that's a community. We're in contact with Christ, and then things begin to change. Um, and the same is true when we're in relationship with each other. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this. Let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Part of calling is being together, encouraging one another, asking each other, hey, how can I pray for you? What, what kind of things do you feel like is the next step for you to grow in your walk and in your faith? What's it like for you at work? And then you stumble across these stories and we help each other figure out how to walk faithfully in it. And we need the encouragement. So whatever calling is, let's live it out with prayer. Let's live it out with community. And then there's one last thing I want to touch on. And I feel like it's something that is assumed when I preach a lot and when I hear a lot of sermons. Uh, and we don't talk about it very much, but I think it's pretty important. And that's the question of why. Why bother? With calling, that's an extra step. I mean, it's hard enough to get through my life as it is, let alone like I got to figure out what God's calling me to while I go to work. Work is hard, man. That's what Sunday morning's for. I can give my time to God then, and then I can move on to the rest of my week. Uh, why would we bother with this? And there's risks involved. Esther's risking her life to step into this calling. Uh, we might be risking something else. What if people think I'm a wacko because I'm thinking about Jesus while I'm at work and I'm talking about him. That's weird. Um, maybe it's a knock in popularity maybe it's perceptions maybe it's a schedule issue give up another night to be in a small group that's a schedule issue what do I do with my money that's, that's priorities and it costs us this two for one thing it's kind of cool but it costs us what if I have to give away a coat that I like um, why bother I saw the Archbishop Desmond Tutu speak he's a cool guy um, he he um, was a Christian leader in South Africa. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in helping bring down apartheid. And uh, what I was struck by as he spoke wasn't so much the content about what he spoke, but he constantly referred to this thing about living life in such a way as to, to bring a smile to God's face. It's like God was there and was cheering him on and was a part of his life. And uh, what does it mean for us to live a life where we bring a smile to God's face? Um, Do I need to get that? <laughs> I think Devin's knocking, so. Um, verses 12 through 14 uh, kind of get at what it looks like to bring a smile to God's face and why we would even bother doing it. Uh, here's what Mordecai says back to her when she says, yeah, but I can't just do this. He says, don't think that just because you're in the king's house that you alone will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that they came to this place for such a time as this. We step out into this life of faith. We do take seriously what it means to be called and to live a particular life. Because who knows? Maybe you were brought to this place for such a time as this. We don't know when the holy moments of this week are going to be. You don't but they will come, and they're in it. And if we're not ready to actually step into them, we might just miss them.
But there's something even uh, right alongside that, and that is that it's life. He warns her that, you know what, God doesn't actually need you to save the Jews. And he frankly doesn't need any of us to accomplish what he's going to do. Uh, I showed up at camp and they're like, if you don't tell these kids about Jesus, you could be the only person who ever does, and they could be eternally lost because you didn't do it. That was a horrible motivation and totally wrong, by the way. If God wants to get somebody's attention, he can get it. Um, but what it is, is in doing that and sharing Jesus with a bunch of kids at camp, I found life. It was fun. We had a great time together. And I really do think that God calls us into these callings and into being purposeful because he wants to give us life. And we can't live fully unless we're walking with him through our days. Maybe it is kind of a life or death thing. Except it's not just other people's life or death. It's, it's our own. We can be kind of zombies cruising through our life and just going through the motions and doing it again and again and again. Or we can be called people who are purposeful and walking with the Lord and see what it means to be fully alive. God's crafted us for that, to live victoriously and to live out of our gifts and to see what God can do in our little lives and in our little friendships and in our relationships. God can do all that stuff. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. And he didn't just say it about eternity. He says it about here. So, this week, we're called. Uh, will you walk it out with Christ? Will you walk into that calling knowing that it might just be in small, really mundane little things? Will you walk it out with prayer? Will you consider doing community alongside of it so that it can help that process along. That's calling. That's what it means to live it out. So, we're called, whether it's on a golf course, walking with somebody, playing around. That's how I want to be called this week, by the way. Um, teaching in a classroom, being an accountant, in the supermarket, having that greeting with that person who might just be having a horrible day checking your groceries and you're the bright spot in that day. Listening to that difficult coworker whine again and you just want to roll your eyes, but you say, no, maybe that wouldn't bring a smile to the Lord's face. Who knows? But you are where you are for a reason. And it's for such a time as this that we're called. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you are with us in this place and that you call us. Thank you that you brought us into your family and that you go with us out of this place as well. Um, show us what it means to be called people and to live for you. Because, Lord, we want to live. We want to live fully. And it's only with you that we can do that. We love you, Lord. Amen.